you know, it, it's, it's a total trip for me to be up here because when I was young, um, the biggest fear I had was public speaking. I began having the, um, this experience in 1981 that got me in a lot of trouble at first. And um, so I'll just tell the story. I'll tell the first story to kind of segue into what I want to talk about. So I had been, um, I had experienced this incredible trauma. And I didn't understand that there's a real correlation between trauma and um, some form of awakening. And so I was in my, you know, in my um, sort of, I think I was 23, 24, something like that. And I just went inwards into, because I quickly figured out that I couldn't figure my way out of my pain and suffering with my mind. And so then I just stepped back and just began to watch what was happening in, you know, just in, just on the inside of me. And um, that was that was the only thing that actually made me feel better. So I began doing that for hours and hours a day. And um, and then what happened after months and months, maybe twenty months, something like that, of doing that hours and hours a day, I got hit by this, this, this lightning bolt, but it wasn't from the sky, it just ignited inside of my brain. And um, what happened next, so within um, that next day, I had a friend, I was living in the Bay Area, and I had a friend who was out, you know, we were hanging out, he came, he was from the East Coast, and um, where I'm originally from, in case you can't figure that out. Um, and that next day I began acting so unlike my ordinary sort of domesticated, conditioned, repressed self that he thought I was just having this total like breakdown. And the experience that I was having was I all of a sudden was having the realization, oh my God, this is a dream. We're having a, this, this mass shared dream. And I felt like I was on the cutting edge of actually this, you know, talk about the Big Bang. I felt like I was totally on the forefront of that. And I was acting so ecstatic, which is to, you know, not be just stuck in my own self, but really in the state of fluidity, that, like I said, my friend thought I was having a total breakdown, psychotic break, and brought me to a hospital. And I remember being brought by hospital via this ambulance. And, um, and what happened next changed my life forever. I mean, it was, walking, it was like walking through a portal. And um, what happened was as follows. I get brought in Highland Hospital, Oakland, California, May 1981. It's nighttime. They bring me into the psych ward. And they bring me, so I, I right away go into, and there's this room where all the psychiatric patients are, like this lounge. And I walk in, and I immediately see this woman, and she's blind. Her eyes are totally opaque. She has, you know, it's clear she can't see, just like a blind person's eyes. And without any thought at all, I just find myself just drawn to her, and I, I go up to her. And as if um, being given these lines to say, as if I had a script, I began saying the words, all you have to do to see is open your eyes and look. And I kept on reciting those words, getting closer and closer to her as I was staring at her eyes. And the whole thing took under a minute, and she regained her sight. And then, as if, you know, just the timing was perfect, then the doctor came with these attendants and took me, and I, they put me in another room, and I, I spent the night like this. I was, you know, just sort of like with whatever, like chains or something, just strapped up on a bed. And, you know, um, I didn't get a typical night's sleep that night, you can imagine, and um, it was clear to me as I was reflecting upon what had just happened, that, wow, I'm having like some form of awakening. And so then I began thinking, you know, the subjective experience that I was having was that, wow, anybody I would think about, I was actually, in my imagination, 
bringing with me on the awakening. So I began thinking about all my friends and people I knew, and then I just began expanding the vision to till it got to the point of the entire world and every being on, on you know, in, in the whole universe. Okay, so the next morning they unstrapped me, and um, they put me in a room. I'm sitting at this desk, and coincidentally, the only other person in the room is that person, is that blind woman who's now no longer blind. And um, she's not saying anything to me at all. She just has the biggest smile on her face as she's looking at me. And all of a sudden, my heart chakra just blossomed. And, and then I understood what had happened. It was like, oh, I get it. Her eyes were physically fine, but inwardly, she wasn't letting herself look. And somehow, I kind of, almost like this clairvoyant part of me, sort of saw that in a very eye-opening way, so to speak. And, um, and then, you know, even, I don't think then, but maybe a long time after that, I had the realization, wow, so she was this blind part of me that wasn't letting myself look. It was almost like, you know, she was the embodiment of like a reflection of a part of me that I was helping to see. And she was at the point in her process of being able to heal her blindness. And I was sent by like, you know, central casting, you could say, to just play the role and say my lines. It was almost like I had been preparing for a number of, you know, centuries or lifetimes or something for that moment. Then, so keep in mind, she, had, she hadn't said one word to me, and all of a sudden she says to me, aren't you going to answer the phone call from your father? And she says, my father's name. And, um, and my father's the one I have all my stuff with, you know. And um, so then within seconds, as, you know, into the room walks this nurse and says, my father's on the phone, because my parents had just found out that I had had this psychotic break from reality. So that was the start of my career, in a way. And I got out of that hospital after three days because the doctor in charge of me, he reflected that I had to show him that I wasn't insane or he was going to keep me there for a really long time. So, you know, up until that point, I had just so, to have an experience like that, you just so let go. I didn't care at all that I was in the hospital. But then when I reflected, wow, I don't think I want to stay here for a really long time. I mean, it's, you know, it's May. It's really nice outside. So I completely forced myself down out of my expansive state and began talking about my problems and all that. And he said, fine, you, 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 can, you can go, you know? <laughs> and, and it was funny, because I actually got together with the doctor. And so, so I get out of that hospital, all of my friends who were just, you know, they were like, you know, consensus in the consensus like reality, they were completely convinced, you know, that I'd had this psychotic break and they didn't want to hear anything about, like when I was trying to explain to them in my excitement, what had happened, they just weren't, you know, weren't into it, to put it mildly. But, um, and then that next week I got together with the doctor, because I called him up and I said, look, can we get together for, you know, like a meal? Because I wanted to tell him what had happened. And it was interesting, what he reflected back, he says, you know, how come I, I actually let you go, the fact that you were able to be fluid between the states? If you were really insane, you wouldn't have been able to just step into, you know, your typical identity. And then I told him about what happened with the blind woman, and he got incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and he said, oh, we can't talk about it, patient confidentiality, whatever. And keep in mind that if I was in my typical mind, I definitely would have gotten her name and number just to sort of, you know, as some sort of evidence that I wasn't just out of my mind. But in a way that I want to say that I, I actually was out of my mind in one of the ways that I've actually, over the course of time, described what happened to me is that I stepped out of my mind, in the sense, out of my conceptual cognitive mind, and I had the realization that I was actually inside of my mind. Just like when you have a dream and you recognize you're dreaming, what you recognize is that the entire dream is just your own energy projected out as the dream, that you're actually inside the psyche and that what's actually happening in the seemingly outer world is a synchronistic reflection of what's actually happening inside of us. So that's what I was beginning to understand. And of course, this is in 1981, so I hadn't developed the fluency or the language, like, you know, whereas I, I actually write books about this stuff now. But it was, um, 
that was not the end of it because during that next year, I was out in the world. I wasn't in a container. I wasn't in like an ashram or a monastery. I was just out in the world. And I was having, you know, this complete, this unbelievable awakening where stuff began happening that was physically impossible, that wasn't supposed to be happening in this third dimensional reality. And um, so maybe about three, four, five, six other times, I don't really know, I got thrown in hospitals and told, oh, you are mentally ill. You're officially mentally ill. We're, in, we're initiating you into a new career as a mental patient. <laughs> and I just thought they were out of their mind. I was like, you know, and I would reflect back to them that I thought that, which just confirmed to the psychiatrist how crazy I was, in a, in a feedback loop that was really like, you know, not, not, not so cool. Um, it was crazy. And it was difficult. I mean, so that was really, so then the final hospital was in 82. And, um, you know, and my experience at that moment was, oh, wow. I was having the spiritual awakening and the hospitalizations and the psychiatric, you know, the, the system really aborted and shut down my awakening, which from one point of view is very true. But over the course of time, I began to have the realization that, oh, the psychiatric hospitalizations were actually part of the awakening. That was almost like this a shamanic descent into the underworld. Okay? Now, going back to that blind woman thing, I didn't realize at the time, but encoded in that, you see, one of the things that happens when you see that this is all a dream is you can interpret your experiences in waking life as if it's a dream, and dreams speak symbolically. Okay? And so when, at a certain point in my life, so right after the, that, you know, the final mental hospital, I, w I was, I mean, it was, it was so traumatic, because then on top of having the trauma, and the trauma had to do with my father, you know, just emotional abuse and all this stuff, then on top of that, I had, you know, the psychiatric trauma. And so I was in deep trouble. I mean, just inwardly, I was really, really suffering. And then I began having, night after night, these incredible, like, these dreams that I couldn't ignore, and they were just over the top. So it really propelled me into really connecting with dreams and studying dreams and all that stuff. And then I began having the dreams where I was recognizing that I was dreaming and had lucidity. And that, that really blew my mind. That was an experience of a whole different order. But just to go back to that blind woman uh, vignette for a moment. I didn't understand this at the time, but you know, a number of years later when I would contemplate it, I, I, I had the understanding that encoded in that vignette with the blind woman was the seed and the source of my entire work that I now do for my life. Because what I've sort of developed is a way of bringing people together who are tuned in to the dreaming, to that we are having a mass share dream, we're all dream characters in each other's dreams, we're all dreaming up what's actually happening moment by moment, not only just like if you're with one person, but like all of us right here in this auditorium or the all seven billion of us on this planet, we're actually dreaming up moment by moment what is happening. And so in that experience with that blind woman, in sort of encoded or hidden in it was actually, it was showing me that. And so I've been, over the course of time, decoding that more and more and more and mapping and articulating that. And, you know, that brings me into, so one of the things I do is I have all these circles of people all throughout the week, because I'm here in Portland, and it's people who are, to whatever degree, are having awareness or experience of that we're dreaming and that we're having a collective dream and that there's a way of actually hanging out together which is it's not fabricated there's no technique but there's a way of following our experience via the medium of us being together and and just being related to each other there's a way of actually being together and following that and configuring ourselves such that we help each other to wake ourselves up. And that's what my work is about. And, um, and it's something that, you know, it's totally, it's accessible for all of us, for all, you know, every, all seven billion of us. And it's, it's what I call um, to dream ourselves 
awake, that we can actually reflect and inquire into the nature of our experience together so that we actually dream ourselves awake, so that we deepen our lucidity and stabilize our lucidity and, have, can, and we conspire to co-inspire each other. It's a true conspiracy theory, which means to actually breathe together so we can conspire to co-inspire to dream ourselves awake. And what you discover, or what can be discovered, and keep in mind it's an endlessly deepening discovery, is that, you know, that whole idea of we are the Messiah, the idea of that we're, you know, hoping that Christ or the Messiah comes down or something that's external to us, no, that's, that's not quite it. The point is, is that the self, the, the, you know, the, the true nature, is incarnating, and it's not just incarnating through one of us, it's incarnating through all of us, and it's incarnating through our unconscious, through our blind spot, so that we act out compulsively, and if we don't have awareness of this archetypal, transpersonal, higher dimensional energy, will act out in a self-destructive way. So what my current book is about, um, there's an indigenous term. Let me show you the book. So, some of you have probably seen me. I'm out in the hall um, with the book. Um, And what Watiko, Watiko is a Native American indigenous term, and it actually means the spirit of evil. And indigenous shamans and Native American people have been tracking this for a number of years, for centuries. And what, and I can just talk for me, what I'm continually like discovering in my own life is as I more awaken, and get like kind of connected or being able to transduce light, that the light, it doesn't mean anything unless it makes the darkness conscious, unless it helps you to see in the dark. The whole idea that you know one becomes enlightened not by just imagining the light, but by actually making the darkness conscious. That's a, um, Jung has a famous quote like that. And um, the idea is this, is that when there's great darkness, it's an expression that there's incredible light nearby that's casting that shadow. And so one of the big mistakes I see with a lot of like, um, you know, spiritual people um, is that they're very into the light. They don't even want to talk about any darkness. They don't want to, because in their, their, you know, the story they have in themselves is, oh, if I focus on the darkness, it's going to feed it. And that's true on one level, but what will feed it even more is that if out of fear you avoid the darkness and you don't look at it and become blind to the darkness, that actually feeds the darkness. But if you see the darkness and don't become just overly like attached to it or fascinated by it or identified with it, but if you see it, then you can choose, oh, how do I want to place my attention? What about now that I see you, I can choose to place my attention over here and create the world that I want to live in. That's different than just looking away from it out of avoidance. Okay? Now, what I talk about in the book is that encoded in this darkness, in the shadow, and think about the shadow, it's not just a personal shadow, but it's also like more of this collective shadow. That if we don't, so here's the thing with, with Watiko, it operates through the unconscious blind spot of us through the psyche, compelling us to act out in ways that are self-destructive. One way of describing it is that it's a psychic, it's a blindness, a psychic blindness. Think of the blind woman. A psychic blindness that actually believes, no, it's, it's, it's not that she believed this, but it's a psychic blindness that, that, that has a belief that it's not only sighted, but arrogantly believes that it's more sighted than anybody else. That's what Tico in a nutshell, okay? And but what I'm pointing out in the book is that, so it's like this, this like, sort of like a tapeworm where a tapeworm gets in you and it'll inject chemicals where you crave food that feeds the tapeworm. So it grows and it kills the host, which is you. 
it's a, it's, it's a psychic tapeworm, Watiko. And, um, and it feeds on our unawareness of it. It flavors our perception so that we don't see it. We see through its lens out in the world, but we don't see how it actually distorts our perception. And when you begin to see it, it can't stand that because then it becomes out of business. Because when you see how this kind of like darker spirit that operates through the unconscious actually compels you to become its instrument, when you see that, you take away its omnipotence and its autonomy and it can't act itself out through you anymore. So what I'm pointing out in the book is that encoded in the Watiko virus is a blessing that's actually helping us to wake up because the Watiko virus is showing us the dreamlike nature of reality. So here it is, it's like a quantum phenomena, you know, like is light a wave or a particle? Well, it depends, how do you observe it, right? Same thing with like Watiko. Is it killing us? Is it gonna destroy our species? Is it gonna take down, you know, the entire, the biosphere? Or is it gonna wake us up? Well, it depends how are we gonna, how, how are we going to actually dream the dream, okay? Because the thing about Watiko is that it actually plugs in, we're all these, like in a sense, geniuses. In the sense that we have a genius for creating reality. And the Watiko will plug into our creative genius in a way that turns against ourselves. An example, say if you're in a dream, if you're in a night dream, right, and you're holding a particular perspective in that night dream, keeping in mind that what is a night dream, but it's just a reflection of your own mind. So if in that dream, if you all of a sudden change your viewpoint in the dream, the dream has no choice but to shapeshift, spontaneously shapeshift and reflect back the change in viewpoint in no time, outside of time, faster than the speed of light, it does that. And that's not just in a night dream, that's in the waking dream too. So if we hold a particular point of view, and if we have this universe solidified in any particular way, being like a dream, this world will instantaneously shape shift and reflect back our viewpoint, confirming to us, at least in our imagination, now we have all the evidence to, to prove to us that our viewpoint is correct, so then we get entrenched even more in our viewpoint, and the more entrenched in our viewpoint we get, the more the universe just reflects that back in a feedback loop that happens outside of time in such a way that we've tricked ourselves and our own genius for reality creation is getting turned against us in a way that's not serving. So what my whole work, which started 30 years ago or more in that psych, you know, in that psych unit with that blind woman, is trying to show people when you bring people together who are waking up to the dreamlike nature, and that includes yourself, that we're all these dreamlike beings, that when you try to find out who you are as an actual like independent, intrinsically existing entity, what you find is very interesting because you don't really find anything of substance. In the same way with the outside, with the, with the world outside, it's all very fluid and impermanent and it's a function of consciousness. So when you bring people together who are tuned in and turned on to that, to the dreamlike nature, you can actually change the dream. And that's evolution. That's what's available to us as a species. And this isn't just some sort of theory. You know, oh, it sounds great. But, um, you know, like I was saying, I have these, these circles of people. And, um, you know, it happens, three, you know, all throughout the weekend right here in Portland. And then it, it, brings, it brings up the idea of what you discover is that who we are are these artists. We're these multidimensional artists whose canvas is this universe. And so I've actually, I've been, um, you know, creating, and you're all invited to join in. There's no, there's, there's not any membership fee. There's full benefits. I'm, I'm helping to create, because it's not just me. It, it has to be a collective creation. It's called an art happening called global awakening in which more and more of us actually are waking up 
And what you wake up to is that we're not separate. You snap out of the spell. It's really like a spell that we exist as these, these isolated entities that are separate from each other and that are in competition with each other. But when you are in a dream and you wake up in the dream, you realize, oh, wow, we're actually dream characters. We're actually interconnected, interdependent parts of one another. And we can actually, that we're all on the same side and we can actually help each other to awaken. So that's, in a way, the art happening called Global Awakening. And the way to really even get a deeper understanding of that is through the imagination, because what you discover is that every moment of our experience is a function of our imagination. So just imagine for a moment, if we can invoke the imagination, what I call like, you know, the sacred imagination, or call it a whole number of different terms, but um, just imagine you're in a dream. And imagine you, you recognize you're in a dream. You have lucidity. You've stabilized the lucidity, right? And then just imagine that, so what happened for me? So that was my experience basically, you know, in 81. But I hadn't integrated it and I hadn't, you know, developed any sort of skill in, in transmitting my realization without completely freaking people out. Um, but imagine then in that dream that you've just woken up in, you've recognized it's all your own mind. You're recognizing, oh, all the other characters in the dream are aspects of me, just the dream characters. And then imagine that you meet somebody else in the dream who also has lucidity. And you hang out and you share notes. And you contemplate what you've discovered. Oh my God, this is a dream. This is all our own mind. We're all dreaming this up. And more and more and more. So then you meet like another character and then there's 10 or 20 or 100 of the dream characters in the dream that are having this realization. What you discover is that you can change the dream. You can put your sacred power of, of dreaming together in a way where you can change the dream you're having. And that's what's available to us as a species in our waking dream, you know? And the thing which is interesting is I was talking about making the shadow, making that, you know, this, the, the shadow conscious. Built in, it's almost like a mathematical equation, built into the whole system and I imagine, this is just my imagination, but we've probably all experienced this, that as we get closer to the light, the actual dark gets even more you know, ferocious or intense or whatever. It's almost like it's invested in us not waking up. And so it's interesting because, and one way, one way that I found this, that I discovered this in my own life was so here I had mentioned the whole origin of my process was this deep trauma from my father who wound up being really kind of like, you know, a real psychopath. But people didn't know that, but I was the one, I was the only child who was like, you know, sensing something and pointing at it and um, didn't understand that that's not a very popular, like, a voice in a, in a system. And what I, what I understood was as I was trying to shed light on the darkness that was coming through my father and was playing out in the family, that the entire family system, including not just my mother and the relatives, but my friends and then the mental health system, they all conspired to protect the abuser. And I couldn't believe it, but it was, you know, the more I was mapping that, the more I was like having the realization, oh my God, there's like this, not like a, a non-local, protection racket, the, the word non-local is a physics term that basically means it transcends third dimensional space and time. So there was like a higher dimensional process that was, that was elaborating itself through the field, through the non-local field, such that whenever light was trying to come in, it seemed to be protecting the dark. Now, that seems to be an expression of something really like evil and dark and sinister. And from one point of view, that's true. But when you actually see that, when you actually see how the field is, is, is like doing that and protecting the darkness, that's actually 
can help you to wake up to the non-local field. So what seemed to be evil, what seemed to be darkness, is actually the very thing that's helping you to wake up. It's the darkness itself that actually wakes you up in a certain way. And so one of the expressions, if not the expression, of this understanding that I'm talking about when you have the realization of the dreamlike nature and that we can actually help each other to dream ourselves awake and, uh, and you begin to realize that this world is dreaming itself awake through us, that we're the instruments. Like I was saying, we are the Messiah and when we, it's just simply having that recognition of that and stabilizing that and not forgetting. Just like it's the same thing when you're in a dream, you can have the recognition that you're dreaming. That's not hard, but it's so easy to get absorbed back into the form so the dream and forget. But when you stabilize that realization, and particularly when you hang out with other people, and you all help each other to stabilize that, that understanding, then an incredibly strong field gets conjured up that more and more begins to attract the rest of the universe into itself. And that's what's available to us. And the energetic expression of this understanding is compassion. Because what you begin to see, like, and, and how I know this from my own experience, even though I feel like such a beginner, in that I feel like I have such a ways to go to more cultivate compassion, you know, for parts of myself, for other people who really trigger me or whatever, um, but how I understood this, the first dream I ever had in which I had the recognition that I was dreaming, as soon as I recognized that I was dreaming, and this was 30 years ago or something like that, I spontaneously, without even thinking about it, began chanting a mantra that I, did, that I, was, that I didn't even really know this mantra, and the mantra was Om Mani Peme Hung. You probably know it, it's the mantra of compassion. And, and then the second time I, I had, luc you know, became, had, had lucidity in the dream, same thing. As soon as I recognized I was dreaming, it was like this deeper part of me, Om Mane Pemi Hung, Om Mane Pemi Hung. And I just began chanting that and radiating out compassion and love for all beings in the dream who I was having the recognition were just aspects of me. And I didn't understand at the time that in Tibetan Buddhism, they'll talk about that when you have awakening, it's always the co-joining of two factors of what's called emptiness and compassion. And emptiness, that's the lucidity, that's, that's having the recognition that this world you're in is not separate from your own consciousness, that it doesn't exist separately from your own mind. So from that point of view, right now we're having a dream and you are all like dreaming me up here moment by moment to say whatever it is I'm saying. Because people were, you know, before the talk, they were saying, they were, they were saying to me, so what, what are you gonna talk about? And I would say, well, I, I have no idea, really. You know, I mean, it's, cause it's, it's way more interesting for me that way, seeing what's gonna come out of me than if I had something prepared. And the interesting thing is, I was talking about how we're all artists. And I was talking about the darkness and the, the watiko and the evil. And just etymologically, this all ties together because the word daimon, the daimon, it actually is the guiding spirit or the inner voice. That's what the word means. And it's related to the word genius, which is related to the word genie, as in I dream of genie, the old TV show. That's related to the word calling to hear a voice and vocation. So the point is, is that if you honor your daimon, which is sort of like this transpersonal spirit, it's like that voice that can potentially be, you know, the, the source of guidance and inspiration. If you, if you get in relationship with that daimon and honor it, you'll find your genius, your calling, you'll find your voice, you'll find your vocation. But if you turn away from that daimon, say if it's telling, like for me, at a certain point, my daimon was telling me, oh, I'm an artist, or I'm a healer, or, you know, 
And if I would have turned away from that and said, oh, I can't do that, I can't make a living, I have to get a day job that I don't like and I'll just, whatever. What, what happens when you turn away from the daimon, it becomes a demon, okay? But if you actually honor what the daimon is showing you and telling you, it, like I said, it, it helps you to find your genius, your vocation, your calling, all those things, your, your inner voice. And one of the, Jung was asked about the, the daimon and the daimonic. The daimonic, you see, it's very interesting. It's a, it's a transpersonal archetypal energy. So it's not a personal energy. It's an energy that takes over a person or a group of people or a nation or a species and they become the instrument through which that daimon, that higher dimensional archetypal transpersonal energy acts itself out. And the daimonic, according to Jung, encoded in the daimonic is the not yet made real creative. So the point is, is that to the extent that any of us can actually tap into the part of us that's the creative artist in whatever medium, it doesn't make a difference what medium we use, that in a way is in the service of connecting with our daimon and our genius and our vocation and our calling and all those things. And how we can actually help each other because what you discover when you wake up in a dream by not being separate, by being interconnected and interdependent is that if I help you, if I'm serving you in some way, I get as much benefit as you do because we're not separate. And that's a whole new sort of way of, of seeing the world and seeing ourselves. And the thing about um, what I write about in my book, Watiko, is that, so it's a spirit of evil. And I'm not making any metaphysical claims because I'm, I'm not a metaphysician in that way. I'm just saying in the psychological realm, it's, it's not even a question that there's something called evil that get, we all play it out every day in different ways. But what, what I'm, the point I want to make at this moment is that that Watiko actually, to the extent that we don't see it, it can inspire us to, in a compulsive way, act out whether it's addictions or habitual patterns or this limited identity or self-destructive behavior that doesn't serve us, but it also plays itself out collectively on the world stage. So the Watiko virus is actually informing what's actually happening in the world and contiguous with that manifestation of Watiko on the world stage, on the world stage is that it's showing us, it's actually revealing to us that we're dreaming, but only if we have eyes to see, you know? And then that's why the importance of actually hanging out with other people who are also having awakenings. What, one of my favorite definitions of the word bodhisattva in Buddhism is a being in the process of awakening. And who among us is not in the process of awakening? We're all these bodhisattvas in training. And what you discover is that we can actually hook up with each other and get in sync and in phase and hang out with each other in a way where we can help each other to deepen our realization. That's why in, in Buddhism, They'll talk about the, 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 jewel, the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the teacher, the teaching, and the community. And the Buddha literally says one of the most important supports for enlightenment is the community, is who you hang out with. He actually says don't hang out with fools. Hang out with other people who are also plugged in to the dreamlike nature. What the word Buddha literally means is he who is awakened to the dream. So, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of a very creative situation because when people ask me, well, what is this art happening called Global Awakening? I, I don't know what to say, except I'll say to them, well, what, what is your imagination? How do you, if you were to wake up in the dream right now, fully and utterly wake up and have lucidity right now in this dream, what would you do? How would you dream the dream? And I would like to suggest that it prob you probably wouldn't be fully satisfied until every being on the planet gets it, until we all wake up. And that's the whole idea of, of the bodhisattva in Buddhism, 
is that they, they've woken up, they've attained enlightenment, they're, they're about to enter to nirvana, and then they look back and they see all their, their fellow suffering brothers and sisters. And they, what they've woken up to is that, oh my God, they're all not separate from me. Here, these are the parts of me that are still asleep, that are still under this spell. That's when they make the, the whole, the, the, the bodhisattva vow of, I'm not gonna enter nirvana until I bring everybody else there first. And like, I'm, like I've been saying, we're all these bodhisattvas. And I want to combine that with like being a shaman because the archetype of the shaman typically gets constellated when there's like a deep disturbance in the psyche, when there's abuse, a wounding, trauma. That constellates the, the archetype of the shaman because then what happens? We're split. A part of us is disassociated. So that activates the part, this other part of us to go in search of ourselves. That's the journey, the shamanic journey. And typically the shaman, when they get called, it's not something you ever decide consciously, oh, I'm gonna go to shaman graduate school or I'm just gonna take a workshop and become a shaman. No, you get called by the spirits. And if the would-be shaman or bodhisattva or healer, like fill in the blank, if they, when they get called, if they don't, assent and agree to the calling, that's when they get really sick to the point where they can really go, go totally out of their minds and even die. But if you actually subscribe and sign on and say, okay, I'm gonna follow this deeper process that I've gotten sort of enlisted into, then you discover that the same energy, that, that all of a sudden you'll be starting to get exactly what you need for help allies or students or clients or customers or teachings or whatever because the same energy that was the sponsor of the actual initiation of being wounded is the same sponsor, it's the same source that sends you exactly what you need but what it needs in order to do that is for you to assent and say yes and cooperate with that deeper calling. And so typically when a shaman gets called, it looks like they're having this breakdown because their whole constitution, their whole inner constitution is being deconstructed so as to be re sort of, you know, kind of creatively designed in a whole new way or engineered. And, uh, and part of the shaman, as I think all of you know, is in, always involves a descent into the underworld, into the unconscious, into the dark. But then if you're able to not get caught in that, and the shaman also takes on the illness of the, of the person they're working with or the tribe or the community, and they literally get sick themselves. But if they're able to not stay stuck in that sickness and actually are able to um, come out the other side, you know, typically they're presented as, oh, then they have incredible blessings or gifts for the community. And what I'm, why I'm talking about the shaman who's related to the bodhisattva is that we're all shamans in training. And don't think of our, you know, like the old shamans, their implements might be rattles or drums. Maybe our implements might be like a video camera or a keyboard of a computer, you know? And the bodhisattva and shaman, it's totally related to like, there's an archetype of the wounded healer. And um, that's something that I know really, really well because of having this profound wound that I got from my father where for a long, long time I would be blaming him, and oh, if only he didn't do this, and more and more I've understood, oh, well, that, this is my initiation. This was somehow, from the cosmic point of view, my way to get introduced to this deeper non-local field to that we're dreaming, and the archetype of, of the wounded healer is it's not by going around the wound, but by going through the wound that the wounded healer gets their gifts and is able to actually be with other people in their wound in a way where they can be of benefit for people. So that, you know, the whole point is, is that we're all wounded healers, we're all bodhisattvas, we're all shamans, we're all having awakenings, and we can actually hang out with each other, support each other in a way that helps all of us to awaken. And, that, and that's like totally mind-blowing because instead of it being a competitive thing, it's actually something that we all have access to right now, you know? So, um, 
yeah, it's too bad, like, you know, I don't have, there's not a space, you know, for it to happen, you know, during this conference. But um, just let me share with these groups I have, and I'm wanting to get these out to the world. I mean, we've been wanting the people, there are people in the groups for 15 years, for 12, 10 years, in the sense that there's something that's so amazing when you bring people together who are actually turned on to that we're dreaming in a way that it's like a psychedelic. It's like going into a flotation tank and having an altered state. And, um, but what I'm talking about is that the actual, the medicine or the, 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 the vehicle isn't you know, necessarily a substance or something, but it's actually just there's a way of configuring ourselves relative to each other that um, is incredibly helpful for all of us. That creates this win-win.